fantastic. You have, you are blessed to have such an amazing pastor leading you here. Come on. I'm telling you. And you know, when I come here, well, I don't feel like I'm a visiting speaker. You, uh, you make me feel like I'm home here, Nathan. And I want to thank you for that, you know. Because honestly, sometimes, sometimes, you know, I travel the world and sometimes, you know, you, um, maybe it's my phone over there. Um, you know, you just, you go to a church and you just preach and then you go. But I always look forward to coming here. Um, not only because I'm, I'm made to feel very welcome. The hospitality is amazing. Um, every time I come here, Pastor gives me a lovely tent. Um, and, and it's waterproof, which is such a blessing. And, and then somebody comes and gives me bread and milk in the morning. I, the generosity is just quite amazing here. I can't get over it. But um, I, I'm sure, you know what, I, I'd love to make this an annual thing, Pastor. I'd love to come back every year, do this. I really would. Because, you know, like, um, uh, I was a pastor for 26 years, and I handed the church over eight years ago, and I've been traveling the world. But you know what? I'm very selective where I go. And it seems as if there are um, a few churches where uh, I, um, I'm connected with on an annual basis because I know that, you know, I'm not just, just coming in as a preacher and going. Something of a, uh, something's left here. There's a deposit. Um, and so that's why I love coming here, Pastor. Thank you for having me. And um, tomorrow morning, um, if you have some friends that may be struggling with anxiety or fear or, you know, wh whatever, I'm going to be preaching a message on how to live in the peace that makes no sense. And it's going to be powerful. So come along tomorrow. You know, when the Bible talks about the peace that passes understanding. In other words, you were worrying because you're not worrying. Why am I, why am I in this terrible situation and yet I've got this peace in my life? What is that? I'll be talking about that tomorrow. Um, Last session. Can you take some more? Can you take some? You guys are amazing. I mean, last night and this morning, just amazing. But let me just set the scene here. Um, sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes um, I just feel like I wish I could be a better person. I wish I could be stronger. I wish I could be. And I was going through a season uh, of, I want to give up as a pastor. And uh, I was going through this season, and I thought, you know, the church deserves better than, than what I can give them. So I'm going through this situation, and then um, I'm walking uh, through a mall, and I saw um, um, there was a store there, and it, and it was under, it was, it had been refurbished, and it had a big sign across the front of the store, and it said, maintenance work being carried out here. Sorry for any inconvenience. So the Holy Spirit said, look, tell that to the church on Sunday. Okay, so I went home and I explained, look, you know, I have, haven't been the pastor I wanted to be, but maintenance work being carried out here. Sorry for any inconvenience. Then I said, how many wives would like to say that to their husband? How many husbands would like to say that to their wives? How many kids want to stand up and say, look, mom, dad, I haven't been the kid I wanted to be, but maintenance work being carried out here. Do you know what happened? The whole church stood up. Everybody stood up. And something broke in our church. In other words, we began to realize we're all dealing with stuff. We're all going through stuff. And that's why I want to talk to you in this last session on living with a servant heart. Living with a servant heart. The reason why sometimes we get disappointed with ourselves is because we focus on what I call 
the wow factor instead of the how factor. And I say that because I read these words of Jesus here in Luke chapter 12, verse 27. I think that will come up on the screen. Oh, I love this. Jesus is so amazing. The way he uses analogies to try to uh, help us understand deep spiritual truth. This is one of them. He says, consider the lilies, how they grow. Everybody say how. Consider the lilies, how they grow. I love this. They neither toil or spin. And I stopped there for a while. They neither toil or spin. They are not worrying workaholics like most of us. But they grow out of the soil of grace, which produces no toil, no spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And I meditated on this. And the Lord said to me, Ray, do you want to know the type of growth that I'm pleased with? Do you want to know how to release yourself from worrying about how you are all the time? And he said, consider the lilies. Wow. Jesus does mention the wow factor. Like greater than Solomon. But he wants us to focus not on the wow factor, the end result. He wants us to focus on the how factor. How do we end up like that? How do we become what Jesus has planned for us? He wants us basically to focus on the process of growth, not the end result. And very often, many of us, I was the worst, we look at the wow factor in people's lives, what they've achieved, who they are. And then we think, I want that wow factor for myself. And then we find we are comparing ourselves. And do you know what happens with comparison? Comparison only creates frustration. Forgetting that the wow factor in these people that we admire, the wow factor was dependent on their submission to the how factor. And Jesus said, consider. That word isn't like, uh, or just think about it. Do a study. Meditate. Dive into this. Investigate. I mean, he's speaking in agricultural terms. I, there may be people here who love gardening. I hate it. How people, you know, have you seen people who are really into gardening? They're like crazy. They're like, they live on another planet, like. Oh, the soil, and the, 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 the tomato, and the what? So, I understand we've all got our little thing. For me, it's golf. For you, it's gardening. Whatever lights your candle. But gardening, not for me. But the Lord said to me, Ray, consider how. So, I started to do study into whatever you call it, horticulture, whatever, the gardening stuff. And I was amazed. Watch. The how is not gifted. It's grown. None of us are not gifted to live. We have, I'm gifted to preach. And I'm gifted to do what I'm called to do. But I'm not gifted to live life. And and when the Lord showed me this, I began to realize that the how factor in a plant um, takes, um, takes place in, there are five principles that are, that are involved in the growth of a plant. I'm only going to deal with two for time, right? Um, actually, this message in its full content is in my book, Grace for the Soil. I think there's two chapters on it, okay? So I'm only going to do, here are the five principles that I discovered when I studied this. First of all, 
the plant needs, the seed needs devotion. Then it needs drainage. Then it needs darkness. Then it needs dung. There's many other adjectives I could use, but dung for the sake, because it's a D. And then fifthly, it needs death. Those five principles, when I consider how. Wait, what do you mean by devotion? Well, watch this. First of all, a plant needs to devote itself to the environment that will cause it to grow. John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus again using agricultural terms. Watch this. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is what? Come on, shall we now? Planted. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies. That's crazy. It remains alone. Wow, I meditated on that for weeks. Jesus said, if the seed is not planted in the correct environment... It will die and remain alone. It will remain isolated. It will remain unproductive. And it will remain independent. In other words, for the potential of the seed to be released, it has to get devoted to the environment God has designed for that to happen. And the one thing, the one thing, that stands between potential and fruitfulness is soil. People can come to you and say, man, you've got lots of potential, but it doesn't, that potential is not released until we find the right soil to root ourselves in. The one thing, the first priority concerning the how factor is, is the type of soil essential for our growth as believers. Look at this. Jesus continues the agricultural theme. Matthew 13, verse 31. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Watch. Say it again. Planted. Say it out loud. Planted. And then he showed me this verse. We know it well. Psalm 92, verse 12 to 14. The righteous, that's the saved, people that are born again, believers, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. They shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Watch. Those who are what? Planted. Or a word I like to use, devoted. The seed has to be devoted to to the soil, or planted, watch, those who are planted where? In the house of the Lord, shall flourish in the courts of God. They shall bear fruit in old age. I can't relate to that, but one day I will. They shall bear fruit in their old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Then I saw it. God has provided the soil for our growth, and that's the local church preaching the gospel of the grace of God. And I want to tell you, if you were planted in this house, no wonder you are seeing growth in your life, because you're planted in the right environment to grow. Come on, somebody, say amen right here. Now watch this. Your life is a seed. God does everything with the seed. Our lives are a seed. And your life as a seed needs to be devoted to the soil of the local church. Otherwise, Jesus said, you'll remain alone, you'll be unproductive and independent. And one of the main ingredients, I, well, then things began to make sense when I read the book of Acts. One of the main ingredients for the impact of the early church to their world was their devotion to the soil, the local church. Watch, Acts 2 says they devoted themselves. They planted 
themselves. The apostles didn't send text out every Monday, where were you last Sunday? Uh, They weren't sent emails, hope to see you next Sunday because we haven't seen you for three weeks. No, no. The apostles just preached the word of God and prayed, but the people devoted themselves. Am I looking at a bunch of people that are prepared to devote themselves to the local church? Come on. Somebody say amen here. They planted themselves. There's a difference between planting a seed and placing a seed. If you merely place yourself on the surface of the local church, then the wind of preference will easily blow you away. The preference of relational offense. Somebody offends you, you go to another church. The wind of the better option, the wind of satanic deception will easily blow you away. And then Jesus, this makes sense, in Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sow and the seed. Again, agricultural. And he says this, we know it, Mark 4, verse 3 to 9. He said, some of the seed fell on the footpath, some on shallow soil, some fell among thorns, but some actually fell on fertile soil, fell on the environment it was designed for it, and it sprouted and it grew and it produced. And I'm going to make this statement. Planted Christians are the only material suitable for building God's house. And I believe, that's why you are here last night and this morning, I believe I'm looking at a bunch of seeds who have decided to devote themselves to the soil of the local church. Am I speaking to the right people here? Amen? Now watch this. This is powerful. Because, you know, it's amazing when God opens a door of revelation. I mean, it's like, it's like a, it's like a, it's, it's like a whirlwind. It just sucks you in. And, and then I started to think, well, it says here also in Psalm 92, not only will they grow, but they will become like the cedars of Lebanon. Now, it means nothing to us, but there must be a reason why God calls planted Christians cedars of Lebanon. So I did a little bit more study. And uh, I discovered something amazing. You know, the cedars of Lebanon, there were four kinds of them. There were four different types of cedars. And all four types of cedars are needed to build the local church. First of all, I discovered there was a cedar called the small cedar. Now, this tree was very viscous. It was very sticky, and it was great for transportation. On their journey from the forest to the temple to be used by God, the cart had to negotiate tricky bends, bumps in the road, while other trees had to be tied down. The small cedar was so sticky and so viscous, it didn't need that restraint. And I'm thinking, they stuck together, whatever the journey threw at them. And I heard the Holy Ghost say to me, Ray, I still need small cedars to build my house. Planted believers, watch, who will stick with the vision, whatever the terrain. And I think I'm looking at, no church has an easy ride, but I'm looking at some small cedars here. Sticking with the vision, however unpredictable, however uncomfortable the ride. And you know what? They encourage others to stick with them too. Come on, somebody say amen. Uh, So God still needs small cedars. Then another type of cedar was the tall cedar. They were so-called because of their root system. Their roots actually held the mountain together. If you took the tall cedar out of the mountain, the whole thing would subside. 
If you removed them, you'd have a massive landslide. God still needs tall cedars to build his house. Watch. People whose roots go down deep into God's love and grace. Watch. The Bible says, be rooted and grounded in love. Tall cedars, they enable the local church to hold things together when things seem to fall apart. They stay when others leave. They encourage when others slander. They stand strong when others quit. Am I looking at some tall cedars here today? I'm sure I am. Then number three was the fire cedar. Wow. These trees, they were great fire lighters. They were easy to ignite, perfect for bringing warmth and excitement into the temple. God still needs fire cedars to build his house. They don't need constant affirmation. They don't need pats on the back. It's in their nature to do what's needed without the constant encouragement or the title. They just turn up and serve because they cannot help themselves. And I know we've got some fire cedars in this house. Come on. Are you receiving this this morning? And the fourth one, this was, this was a beaut. It was called the humming cedar. And the humming cedar, they grew on top of the mountain. And they grew tall and they grew mainly on the top of the mountain. And when the storms came, when the wind was blowing strong, if you were standing in the valley and just be quiet and listen to the wind blow through the branches of the humming cedar, it was as if the forest was singing. It was as if the forest was using the storm and the wind to add a melody to their song. God still needs humming cedars to build the church. When others criticize, they praise. When others complain about the storm, they just sing to it. Come on, somebody, say amen. I'm preaching myself happy. Is this helping you here? Watch, this is powerful. Because the servant heart, the servant spirit runs through all our uh, process of, of growth. And I did, uh, and then the Lord said, Ray, Ray, you need to take the devotion test. It's not a works thing, but you need to take, check your heart, just check. Just, just, and I said, what do you mean? Uh, and then he showed me something so powerful. Because devotion to the local church, to the soil, is not something that's a, a hard thing or something we've got to do or else. It's just part, it's having this revelation, understanding it's the only soil that God has provided for us to grow. And then he said, Ray, you, it, it, I knew it was the test, right? So I started to read Haggai chapter 1, verse 9. And God says to the people, my house lies in ruins while all of you are busy building your own. And then Luke 14, 23, Jesus said, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. And then we all know the scripture, Jesus says, I will build my church. Paul talks about my gospel. And when I started to think about this, the test to determine your devotion to the soil of the local church is wrapped up in that little word, my. One little word distinguishes the devoted from the disinterested. That one little word, my, distinguishes from those that are planted and those that are just placed. 
It's a little word, my. What is it that will cause us to do everything we can to protect this house from splits and disunity? What is it that will cause us to sacrifice financially, socially, so that this house is finalized? What is it that will cause us to die to ourselves and serve this house to see that it's healthy? It's when we not just say his house, but when we start to say my house. Unless we can say, my house, we'll never stay in on church long. Unless we can say, my house, we will never prioritize our finances, our time, our passion to ensure that this house stays healthy and strong. One little word, my, do you know what it does? It brings a sense of ownership. It brings a sense of responsibility, of protection, of love of pride in the right sense. And I'm thinking about this. And this is what the Lord said to me. Wait a second. Man, he said, Ray, I took what was yours and I made it mine. Will you take what is mine and make it yours? And he almost took my breath away. He was wounded for my transgression. The chastisement of my peace was on him. And with his stripes, I am healed. So let's not just repeat the slogan, I love my church. Let's show it with our devotion to the soul. Are you an amen here? So that's, so the first process, I'm only dealing with two, the first process for this, Jesus said, consider how they grow. You want to grow strong? Then this is the first step. Devotion to the soil. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to deal with the last one. And that is darkness. The soil, need, the seed needs the darkness of the soil. Do you know what's quite amazing? The greatest work in the plant is done out of sight. It's done in the earth when no one can see. That's where the greatest word work for the seed, for the potential to be released. The greatest work for, for release of potential is in the darkness of the soil. That's where real potential in the seed begins to develop. In the darkness of obscurity, now watch this, in the darkness of serving God when heaven is silent. That's where the real work in our character is done. And uh, there we all want the wow factor, but we don't like this process of the how factor when you're overlooked when you're not appreciated. You know, uh, before I was a pastor, I, I traveled for seven years as a youth evangelist. I had the privilege of seeing thousands of pe young people saved. Sometimes I would do 30 concerts a week. And uh, only the grace of God could sustain me for that. But you know what? I, 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 um, in, a, in, a, in a space of about three months, it was quite unusual. I'd be traveling in an airport and someone would come up to me. Are you Ray Bevan? I said, yeah. Thank you for coming to my school when I was 12 to tell me about Jesus. Then I looked at them and they're in their 50s. It made me really depressed. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, anyway, so, and then, I'd be walking through a shop and somebody else would come up to me. Hey, are you Ray Bevan? Yeah. Thank you for visiting my, my mother when she was dying. She really appreciated it. And then, and then and another and another. And I, I, I couldn't remember these things. 
I couldn't remember the instances, you know. And I think, wow. So I'm thinking, why are all these people coming to say thank you in such a short period? It's like it was condensed, and I forgot about it. And then I'm preaching in a church in Bournemouth in a conference, and there was a young preacher preaching, and he stopped. And he said, Ray, you've been asking God why people are coming to say thank you. I said, yeah. He said, Ray, Jesus is trying to say thank you. Come on, somebody. I mean, this Jesus is trying to say thank you. You see, there are two types of people in the church. A we have people and a when did we people. People that keep an account of all they've done for the Lord. We have, he, they said to Jesus, we have done this, this, this. Look at our achievement. He says, he, we know you. Then he comes up to somebody and says, hey, thanks for going to prison to visit that prisoner. Thanks for going to that sick person. And you say, when did we do that? We can't even remember. You see, that's the servant heart that needs to be developed in our growth. Can I do an amen to it? But it's in obscurity when it seems like we've overlooked. No. And, uh, and I'll finish with this story because when, I'm th- when I was preparing this message, the Lord directed me to Genesis 24 where Rebecca watered 10 camels. You know the story, right? The background is Abraham wanted a son for his, uh, a wife for his, for his son Isaac. So he sent to the servant, the unnamed servant, go back to my homeland and find a wife for Isaac. This woman was going to be in the genealogy of Christ, okay? Quite an important role, I would think. So the servant goes and he's looking for a, the, the right type of woman. Then he comes to this well, and he sits down by the well, and he says, Lord, let it be a sign for me. All the women are going to come to get water from the well. I'm going to ask one for a drink of water, and if she says, hey, listen, I'm, you, you, I, 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 you, here's the water, and I'll, I'll, I'll water your camels as well. Let that be the one. Let that be the one. You see, Rebecca, unknown to her, was about to pass the servant heart test. So we know the story. I mean, 10 camels. Do you know how much those suckers drink? Those humps are for real. I mean, those, they can drink like, so So here's, and and when you read the chapter, watch this now. It tells us a little bit about Rebecca. It, it, it says that she was young. She was gifted. She was beautiful. She was a virgin. She was morally pure. But the door to her destiny as Isaac's wife was not her charisma. It wasn't her contacts. It wasn't even her morality. It was her willingness to serve in heaven is Simon. She wasn't responding to an ad in the early times. Wife wanted to be part of the genealogy that would bring the Messiah into the world. She wasn't responding to an ad, but she must love watering camels. She must be prepared to carry a thousand liters of water with a 10 liter jug starting from 6 p.m. and could take six hours. It will probably mess up your plans for the day, but Rebecca was totally unaware that heaven's gaze was upon her for blessing. Regarding her destiny, she was serving God in the dark. Watch. She had no idea she was standing before a door of destiny disguised as ten thirsty camels. Watch. Now this is powerful. 
This is powerful. And during the whole process, I mean, when you look at the story, read it slowly, she was running. She wasn't just, oh, this is going to put me out. She was running back and forth. You know, giving water to these camels. And this is what got me. Now, the servant was there watching. No pep talk. No encouragement. Come on, Rebecca. You don't know what's at stake here. Go keep going. Don't give up now. I mean, you really don't know how important this is for your destiny. No. Do you know what it says? In Genesis 24, verse 21. And the servant watched her in silence. Do we have that scripture there? I think I give it there. No, the one before that. Is there one before that? Anyway, take that one down. Take that one off because that's the climax. Take that one off. That, that's, that's the eclosure. Verse, Genesis 24, verse 21. And the servant watched her in silence. The servant gave her no indication of the importance of what she was doing. No pep talk. Watch this. Often, God watches in silence, hidden in opportunities to serve, with no applause, no recognition, and no appreciation from those whom you serve. I'll never forget, I'm in my, I'm in my office talking to my secretary, and she's typing away, she's answering the phone, typing. She's talking to me at the same time. See, men can't do that. You women are blessed. You know what I'm saying? There's only two people that understand a woman. That's God and Mel Gibson. The rest of us are totally oblivious. So she's in the office. She's typing away, talk. She said, oh, pastor. I said, yeah, no, not now. No, put that over there. Pastor, I wish I knew you, you're preaching and, and people are up there singing. And, and what gift have I got? And she's typing to me. I don't know what, no, yes, no, I'm talking right now, uh, yeah, 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 next Thursday, yeah. And I, and I don't know. I looked at her, I said, do you know how I type? She said, what do you mean, Pastor? I look like this, I type. I said, you have just typed four letters, organized three departments, and ordered your lunch for next Thursday all at the same time. And you're asking me what I'm not gifted to do? Come on, somebody, do you understand what I'm saying? It may seem what you do is so insignificant. What camels has God sent for you to water? And I know to you, you think, wow, what? This isn't a big deal, really? No, God, watch. You see, because the seed, the potential in your life is being released in the darkness in the obscurity of being overlooked. If you're still with me, say amen here. Mary, the mother of Jesus, he was brilliant at the birth. The angels turned up. She gave birth to the Messiah. Spectacular stuff going on. Then nothing for 30 years. We seem to forget that. Nothing for 30 years. Nothing. Nothing spectacular. She just raised the Son of God. I mean, that would have been kind of a job, wouldn't it? Telling God to come in and have a wash. You know what I'm saying? Jesus, come on, your dinner's ready. I'm saying, I just think that's weird. Anyway, anyway, watch. Rebecca didn't realize she wasn't serving camels. She was actually serving Abraham. Colossians 3, 23. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. And then verse 61 of Genesis 24 make, made all the sense. The servant re, 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 explained who he was what his, what his purpose was, and I love this, verse 61, and it says this, and Rebecca and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. 
the beggar's road to destiny. Watch. The very thing that she served when heaven was silent was the means to carry her through the door of destiny. She rode on a camel. And I'm telling you, that's your transportation to your destiny, a servant heart. You received that? I just got one more story. Have you received that today? Enjoy that? So, uh, this is not just, uh, this is something that every leader goes through, every person goes through. And I remember when I first got saved, I, I didn't get saved in a church. I got saved in a cinema in 19, what was it, 1971, I think, or 1970. Some of you weren't even in the fallopian tube then. But, but I was there, and I was watching a film called The Greatest Story Ever Told, a film about the life of Christ. I got saved in the cinema. I'm so glad the Holy Spirit goes to the cinema. He'll go anywhere where Jesus is lifted up. And I went to a local church for 10 years. And I just wanted, I did everything I could. And I, I, I started to work in the children's church. And I'd spent hours preparing the message. I still got the book in the house. Hours preparing the children's, for, the, for the, that Sunday afternoon, that was my deal. And sometimes I would turn up and only one kid would turn up. But I was just as passionate, no doubt teaching that one kid as if it was like my life. I say that because just a few years ago, I was standing on a platform in South Africa, and I'm preaching, and I'm not exaggerating now. I made the appeal for salvation, and I think it must have been a thousand first-time decisions came forward that morning. And I'm standing there pinching myself. Thinking, Lord, how can you trust me with this? He said, because I saw you watering the camel. I saw you turn up for one kid. Come on. He says, I can trust you with much because you passed the servant heart test. Amen. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you uh, for helping us with areas of our heart. Thank you, God, for... Uh, this revelation that you're giving to us from your word. And I pray for this house. I pray for Nathan and his wife, Megan. I pray for the children, and I pray for the workers in this house. I thank you, Father. I pray that as we meditate on the how question, help us to plant ourselves, not just place ourselves. And Lord, help us not to complain when it seems heaven is silent, but realize that's when you're doing the greatest work in our lives. We love you and we thank you. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you so much for listening.